Hello everyone, today I'm working on a little R290 reach-in cooler that is not getting below 51 Fahrenheit. Alright, so we're going to go over all of our checks we do before we gauge up. Obviously, because it's R290, we have a real critical charge, only a couple ounces in there. Um, you obviously can't put your hoses on. We're only using smart probes at this point, but regardless, on any system that's critically charged, or really any system, we want to go through all these checks before we gauge up. Okay, make it simple. People like to jump to the gauges uh, immediately. It's really the last step in all of the troubleshooting. So we're just gonna go through, we're gonna check for, is our evaporator coil frozen? We're gonna check at our evaporator and condenser fans, fan blades, and we're gonna check if our condenser coil is dirty. And lastly, we're gonna make sure that our compressor is running, but not only running, that the amp draw is correct. So what does that mean? So sometimes on these little compressors, you may get like, let's say 1.3 amps for 10 seconds. Then out of nowhere, it'll drop down to like 1.02 amps for about two, three seconds. And you'll see your pressures will come down. And what's actually happening is the compressor has stopped pumping. So even though you have amp draw and it's the same as the rating plate, it does not mean it's correct. We need consistent amp draw. So if we have 1.3, two, three amps, we need to stay there. We can't have it dropping off after five, 10, 15, 20 seconds. All right, so let's jump into it. Let's start with our evaporator coil and our evaporator fan and fan blade. So let's see if we can get a good shot in here. So it is clear, but I do see a lot of moisture here, which tells me there's potentially some ice on the U-bends. But let's carry on with our checks. We'll circle back to that. Condenser fan is running. The blade is in good condition. The coil is fairly clean. So we can move on from that. And then lastly, our amp draw 1.06 and it's consistent. So let's circle back to our evaporator coil. Like I said, I saw a bit of moisture on there. And look at that. Our U-bends are frozen up. All right, so let's pull up our troubleshooting chart. And we have frozen evaporator coil. So let's just go over all the troubleshooting for that. So we have faulty evaporator fan or blade. We've ruled that out. Bad temp controller. Now this is probably one of the number one problems you'll see on these reach-ins. Uh, the temp controller goes bad and our condensing unit will continue to run below 32 Fahrenheit, which essentially will freeze up the coil. Now based what I'm seeing on this unit is this unit's been running like this for maybe two days. So if I had a bad temp controller, this entire coil would have been frozen over. Okay, so it's really important to do the visual cues here. So let's say for instance, I think the temp controller is bad and I'm not really looking at the ice pattern. At this point, I would fire up the unit and I would wait for it to get to temperature. And once again, it would not get below 51 Fahrenheit, but I would waste a good 30 to 45 minutes. So it's very important that we look at the ice pattern. Okay, how is it freezing? And that's gonna tell us a lot of the story. Next thing is a backed up drain. Well, if we had a backed up drain, what would happen? The ice would be at the bottom of the coil. We can rule this out, okay? Just by visually looking at the ice and through experience, seeing the ice pattern is gonna tell us a lot of the story. The next thing would be the door does not close or seal properly. Once again, the evaporator coil would be covered in frost or ice. If you look back early in the video, I let go of the door. I do that purposely and you hear the door slam shut. Okay, so we can rule that out. And the last thing is low charge. And the last thing is a low charge. So as you guys know, I like to rule out my low charge by adding refrigerant. Because we're R290, I'm not going to tap into this system. I'm going to go directly into a leak test. This system is so small, I can do a leak test in about 20 minutes. If this was not R290, there's a good chance that I would have put the charge back in and ruled in if we're low charge or restricted. So let's jump into a leak test. All right, so we're gonna do a leak test here. Spoiler alert, I've already found the leak. It didn't take me long, but we got a huge hit here at the cap tube. So our leak is somewhere in this section. Um, I am using the combustible leak detector because we're working with R290. And let's just do a bubble test and look at that. That's a day one problem. The unit is out of warranty. It's probably a three year unit, two and a half years old. And there's a great shot right there. Screenshot that for the customer. And we have found our leak. 
All right, so it's always important to flow with nitrogen, but in this case, when you're brazing on the cap tube, it is super, super important to be flowing with nitrogen. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead here and leak test with 404 because I find that this leak detector is a lot more accurate uh, when there's 404 in there versus the gas mate with R290. So this is how I choose to do my leak test, R4 and 4, and my DTAC 3. And as you can see, we have no leaks. All right, so we're all vacuumed up. Let's go ahead and put our charge in. We're at 73 Fahrenheit ambient temperature. All right, so let's go figure out what our suction pressure needs to be. So it's basically going to be our desired box temp minus our EVAP TV. In this case, it's 20 Fahrenheit. So let's call our desired box temp 34, 35. And let's subtract our EVAP TD. And that's going to give us 15 Fahrenheit. And then we're gonna go over to our PT and 15 Fahrenheit gives us 36 PSI. Now to figure out our high side pressure, we're just gonna take our ambient temp and we're going to add our engineered condenser split. So in this case, it's 15 Fahrenheit because this is a newer style unit. The newer style units will use a lower condenser split because it'll help with the energy rating for the unit. So we had 73 Fahrenheit, we're gonna add 15 Fahrenheit, and that's gonna give us 88 Fahrenheit. And 88 Fahrenheit, we're gonna go somewhere in between here, so let's call it around 140 PSI. But really the pressures don't matter. What matters is the saturation temperature. I'm looking for 15 Fahrenheit, and 88 Fahrenheit, okay? So you wanna to get to the point where you're not looking at the pressures, you're just looking at the saturation temperatures. That's really all that matters. So that's what we're gonna focus on. You know, as long as we get within this range, plus or minus a couple degrees. Now if we're minus a couple degrees here on the suction side, that may be an issue. So we wanna make sure we're not below, you know, 13, 12 Fahrenheit. That's gonna be an issue on our saturation temperature. But on our ambient, if we're plus or minus, you know, two or three Fahrenheit, it's not as big of a deal. So let's go see what pressures we are getting. All right, so look at our pressures here, 36 PSI and 147 PSI, but more importantly, suction saturation temperature, 15 Fahrenheit. Condenser saturation temperature, 88 Fahrenheit. We're bang on, we're in the range. And we just cycled off 34 Fahrenheit. We are all good to go here.